Hey everybody, this is Matt Atkinson, and you're watching Four Gettysburg with Aaron Smith. What is going on everybody? Aaron Smith here with another great episode of Forward Gettysburg. I am once again talking about artillery cannons. But thank you guys so, so much for joining me on this episode. Yes, I am talking about Civil War artillery here at Gettysburg. And if you didn't know, the Gettysburg National Military Park has two examples of some very, very rare cannons. Cannons that you're not going to see anywhere else cannons that you're not going to see out here in a field. You might see them in a museum. We are talking about the 12 pounder Whitworth and the 14 pounder James gun. So without further ado, let's get into it. Thank you guys so, so much for joining me. I can't tell you how much I appreciate all the support, the continued support of the channel. So if you guys are liking the Civil War Battle of Gettysburg, Gettysburg campaign content, please make sure to like this video, leave me a comment, let me know what you guys think, and of course, please remember to subscribe to the channel. Of everybody that watches, only about 25% of you are subscribed, so please make sure, hit that subscription button, and I will get into it. Let's talk about Civil War guns. All right, so this gun right here, this is the 12 pounder Whitworth cannon. And this is such a cool gun. This was state of the art technology in 1863. As you guys may have known already, or as you may have realized looking at this gun, this is a breech loading gun. It loads from the rear. Now breech loading weapons provided some safety and efficiency advantages over the old muzzle loading weapons. For example, to load this gun, you didn't have to have your crew of men hanging out in front of this weapon, exposing themselves to enemy fire. No, they had some degree of cover for when they were loading this gun here from the rear, from the rear of the barrel. Also, it was a much more efficient firing weapon. When you have a muzzle loading gun, your projectile has to be just a hair smaller than the width of the barrel, than the bore width here. So you could, had to ram it down and all that kind of stuff. But on this gun, you could have a projectile that wasn't much smaller than the bore itself. And of course, you know, that projectile, it's going to, when the powder charge goes off, it's going to engage the rifling of the gun here. This was a rifled gun. So whenever that projectile goes off, it's going to engage that rifling, making for a much more accurate shot, a much more farther shot. There's not going to be as as many gases escaping through the top and the bottom as you might have on a 12 pounder Napoleon. Now this cannon here had a 2.7 inch width bore. The barrel itself was 104 inches long and it weighed overall 1100 pounds. This was a really, really heavy cannon. Now of all the cannons here at the Gettysburg National Military Park, this was by far the furthest firing gun on the field. This could easily fire a projectile over five miles away. At a five inch incline, this gun could easily hit two miles away. This thing could shoot far. And not only that, but it was incredibly accurate as well. In fact, the Army and Navy Gazette in April 9th of 1864 said the following about the Whitworth. It put every shot into a bullseye one foot in diameter at 300 yards. I know some people that are such terrible shots with a rifle, they couldn't do that with a, with, you know, a regular gun, let alone this enormous cannon here. So this thing was incredibly accurate. This thing could shoot incredibly far. However, it was also an incredibly delicate weapon. Now the Union Army relegated the Whitworth as more of a curiosity. It was more of a, uh, oh, well, that's an interesting gun. In fact, one man during a, uh, Senate committee hearing said the following. He said, it was the perfect thing to show the state of the art, but for actual service, not worth carrying into the field. So though they were accurate, though they could fire a long distance, they were also very delicate. And these weren't American made guns. These were made in England by Sir, I want to make sure I get his name right. They were made by Sir 
Joseph Whitworth. He's the one that invented this style of gun. So they were made in England. They were a foreign cannon. So parts were hard to come by. And especially when you're in the field and you're jostling around trying to haul these over miles and miles on the trail and on the campaign, you know, these things were prone to falling apart. These things were prone to breaking. So it became very difficult to service these things without the proper parts. Now the Confederates had two Whitworths here at Gettysburg. And over the three days at Gettysburg, they would fire 133 rounds out of their Whitworths. And this thing was actually quite impressive. So it was firing like up to five miles away, meaning that these guns here could reach out and pretty much touch any point of the Union line they wanted to, especially Cemetery Hill, where the Union had clusters and clusters of guns at. So when fired, the Whitworth projectile, this bolt, a very long, skinny looking, uh, solid shot, a uh, solid cannonball almost thing, not really a cannonball, but it, it's a very unique looking projectile. When this thing fires, it will fire at over 1600 feet per second. That's the muzzle velocity. That's how fast it's leaving the muzzle. It is going to travel the length of this 104 inch barrel at nearly 1,090 miles per hour. It'll go from the breech to the muzzle at an incredible speed of 1,090 miles an hour. So this thing would take a one and three quarter pound powder charge, and it had a rifling twist rate of about one spin every four and a half feet, which was a much higher rate than other rifled guns at this time. In fact, Sir Joseph Whitworth, during the testing of this gun, he claims that that projectile would leave the barrel at over 60 thousand rotations per minute which is incredible which especially lent itself to the accuracy and the distance this thing was an accurate far shooting gun and it's such a cool cool example of the artillery they have here at the gettysburg national military park i've I've talked about this piece in several of my videos and I keep coming back to it because it is just so cool. It's such a neat, neat piece. So because this projectile was spinning in the air so fast, it would create a very, very distinct, haunting, sharp whistle as it traveled through the air. In fact, Union General John Gibbon would describe the Whitworth shell flying through the air at Gettysburg, almost like a shrieking banshee. So this thing had a psychological effect as much as it had an effect of being an accurate firing, far firing gun. Now the Confederates only had two of these at Gettysburg. All right, guys, so that is the Whitworth rifle. So let's go to another part of the field and we'll talk about another one of my favorite guns here at Gettysburg, the James gun. So we just talked about the Whitworth, a really, really cool gun, and that's over on Oak Hill. I'm now on South Cemetery Ridge. Behind me, you may even be able to make out the Pennsylvania Monument. I am here at the marker of the second Connecticut artillery and right here in front of me is such a cool gun such an interesting gun unfortunately its design led to its uh, dismissal from the army but we are talking about the James gun and the James gun has a really interesting history by this point they kind of figured out rifling and all this stuff and they thought well you know what Let's take the best of both worlds. We have all these 12 pounder bronze Napoleons. Let's put some rifling in them and see what we can come up with. So the very, very first James guns, the type one James gun was essentially the bronze Napoleon with rifling in it. They took bronze Napoleons and they would add rifling into the barrel. Now these here at Gettysburg, these are type two James guns. These were a, a unique, a unique design to this gun, essentially the same thing. Still the, the main idea is a bronze gun with rifling in it. Unfortunately, as we're soon going to see, bronze wasn't the best material for gun rifling. 
So bronze definitely had some advantages when it came to construction and firing of big guns. For example, bronze is a much softer metal. It could handle higher pressures a little bit better. You know, that's why uh, modern day rifle cartridges, modern day gun cartridges are made with brass. It's able to handle those pressures and expand a little bit better than the much stiffer iron, which was very commonly used in, you know, your Parrot guns and your three inch ordnance rifles. In fact, if you guys come out here to the field at Gettysburg and these bronze guns, they are just north of the Father Corby Memorial. These guns look very much like a three inch ordnance rifle. They don't have that jacketed breech like the um, like the parrot gun or anything like that. But the, these essentially look like bronze three inch ordnance rifles. The other thing about bronze is it's able to absorb the pressures of firing these projectiles with, you know, thousands of thousands of PSIs behind them without resulting in catastrophic failure. So the logic behind it makes sense why you would want to make a rifled gun out of bronze. However, bronze being the much softer metal, eventually over time, those grooves, those rifling grooves are going to wear away. Again, bronze isn't as stiff as iron. So an iron gun with rifling in it is certainly going to uh, hold up its rifling much better under the continued pressures and projectiles That was a loud bus. So the iron rifling is going to be able to withstand the, the constant pressure and the constant firing of projectiles down the barrel compared to bronze. So let's get into the stats. Let's get into the data. Everybody loves the information. It was definitely a lot more difficult to find the statistical data on the James gun compared to the Whitworth rifle because everybody loves a good Whitworth cannon, am I right? So this gun at a five inch elevation was capable of firing about 1700 yards. Now a mile is 1,777 yards. So, you know, let's, let's call it essentially a mile at a five degree elevation. These guns would fire a 14 pound projectile. Hence, that's why I refer to them as the 14 pounder James. Um, they would put a three quarter pound, a 0.75 pound powder charge in this to fire that projectile. The James gun had a 3.82 inch bore diameter on it. This gun itself weighed about 918 pounds plus another 900 pounds in the carriage, making this a pretty, pretty heavy gun to use. The barrel length itself was about 69 and a quarter inches long so nowhere near the length of the Whitworth of 104 inches now there were a lot of issues with this cannon we have the grooves the, the rifling grooves wearing away also surprisingly a lot of these guns would become jammed or, or there would be issues ending in a catastrophic failure so by 1862 the ordnance department is going to start to phase out these guns for the union armies however by the time of gettysburg there are still four gun james guns left in the Army of the Potomac, and they belonged here to the Second Connecticut Battery. They had four James guns and two howitzers with them as well. Pretty interesting, pretty interesting gun. Um, this gun has some markings on the trunnion that I'm going to show you guys. You can see the rifling grooves in here. I believe there's about 10 grooves within this barrel here. So definitely a really, really interesting gun and a great example of the James gun here at the Gettysburg National Military Park. Well, everybody, that's what I have for you today. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Forward Gettysburg, taking a look at some of these rare guns out here on the Gettysburg National Military Park. As you all know, as any fan of the show knows, I love cannons. I think they are so, so cool. They're so fascinating. In fact, at my part-time job on Saturdays at the Regimental Quartermaster, stop in on Saturdays, see me, uh, Garrick's 
meal ration reviews i know i butchered the name of that channel but he stopped in chatted up for a little bit that was awesome thank you so much for coming in but if you're a reenactor if you're just into the civil war you want to see some cool stuff come into the store check it out uh awesome store all kinds of muzzle loading rifles uh period uh specific antiques all kinds of stuff for sale all types of clothing boots shoes we have paper ladies in stock those are the paper tubes, so make sure you guys check it out. But I had somebody, a reenactor in from the 4th Maryland Artillery stop in, and we had a great talk about artillery. So if you're out there watching, uh, it, was, it was great to talk to you, and I hope to have you and your unit onto the show one day um, to uh, you know talk more about artillery, which is something I think is fascinating. But guys, thank you so, so much for joining me on Forward Gettysburg. I'm going to be honest, my... Uh, going through some uh, turmoil in my personal life. So, you know, I'm going to try to get episodes out weekly as much as possible. But if there's a week or two weeks that goes by, don't worry. New content's on its way. Just got to uh, just got to deal with some stuff. You know, you know how life can be. But as always, I'm Aaron Smith for Forward Gettysburg. Thanks for watching and I will catch you on the next one.